How can you be a good friend to someone who's autistic? That's what we're going to explore in today's episode of Pookie Ponders. So let's dive straight in. So we're thinking today about how you can be a good friend to someone who is autistic. This was a question that was posed to me by one of my friends indeed, because I am autistic and they wanted to know how to be a good friend to me. And I thought, what a great question and how wonderful of them to ask. So the very first thing on my list of 10 today is ask what you can do to help, because actually we're all different. There's a saying you'll hear again and again and again that once you've met one autistic person, you have met one autistic person and different things will help different people. So the very best person to help you know how to help them is in fact your autistic friend. Um, It's best to ask this question at times of relative calm and happy when they're not overwhelmed. So at the point at which everything's gone to porridge and they're no longer kind of really coping, then saying, what can I do to help you? They may not be able to respond. They may be mute. They may be panicking. They may be whatever, probably not completely kind of in control and in the room. So this is not the moment to ask, but at a time of relative chill and calm, when you're able to have a good conversation, their brain is online, accessing their good problem solving, thinking, speaking skills, this is a good time to have a chat. So ask them, have the conversation. Um, Number two is to learn a little bit about how your friend experiences the world. So one of the funny things about us is that we have sensory processing differences and this manifests differently for different autistic people. Um, But generally we have heightened uh, awareness of the world around us compared to our neurotypical peers. I often wonder what it must be like when you can't smell everything uh, and hear everything on volume 10 and see all the little things going on with great intensity we experience these things uh, differently and it's a lot. And sometimes it's wonderful and can bring us sensory joy. You'll maybe never experience the joy of the smell of roses in quite the same way that I do, but it can also be quite overwhelming. So when walking into a busy, crowded space, being able to hear dozens of different conversations going on at the same time and feeling completely incapable of concentrating on the one I need to, or being able to smell smell the perfume of the person who was in the lift three times before me and not being able to get beyond that smell and feeling choked by it like I might vomit or suffocate or something like that is is not so much fun. Um, But when we just experience our own world each day, every day, we kind of imagine that's how it feels like for everyone. So get curious and talk to your autistic friend and ask them, what do you hear? What do you see? How do things feel? Just so you can begin to step into their shoes a little bit, because if you can begin to get a little bit of an understanding of how the world feels for them in a very literal sensory sense, then you may be in a position to kind of advocate for your friend, to suggest reasonable adjustments, to think about how to help them in social situations when you're out together or thinking about adaptations that could be made so your friend can access things and so on and so forth and even just really simple things maybe your friend is like me and just can't hack perfume and then you would maybe not wear perfume but until you've had that conversation and understood that that smell is so cloying and suffocating and makes you want to vomit then maybe you just wouldn't know and you'd be inadvertently kind of doing something that was kind of making things hard for your friend but maybe they thought it was too rude to say and so they just kind of managed but once you've had the conversation then you'd know so yeah find out a little bit about how the world feels for them get curious about it um, and be prepared to be a little bit surprised um, I would say make sure when you do have that conversation though that you explore the joy end of it as well as the challenge end of it because sure like sensory processing differences and heightened sensory processing can come with massive challenges every day but There's so much joy as well in the way that things feel or taste or smell and so on. Number three in terms of things that you can do is to think about how you communicate with your friend. Clear, direct communication. So if you're friends with an autistic person, you quite possibly have already had experiences of your friend not doing any of the preamble and the chit chat that might become before a very serious question or conversation, but them diving straight in or of them being a little bit 
blunt, honest to the point that can be slightly painful, I'm told sometimes. These are both absolute specials of mine and they're things that I hope my friends have grown to love or at least tolerate uh, about me. Um, I have a rule of no small talk, only big talk uh, with friends and friends generally respect that and we have some great conversations is, as, a, as a consequence uh, of that. But um, yeah, I'm not very good at kind of warming people up. And if you ask me a question, I'm going to tell you honestly. So, you know, we, we don't tend to do the, the, the fluff and stuff around the edges. So appreciate that. And, and no, it's it's not us being rude. It's just we just many autistic people don't engage in the kind of chitter chatter and kind of can't see the point. And so we don't do it. Um, so, so be aware of that. But the other thing in terms of how we communicate differently is that you'll need to be just really clear and say actually what you want and what you need. Never like ask for things in a subtle way. Don't expect us to pick up nuance. If you are hot and you'd like me to open the window, don't just say, I'm hot. Say, I'm hot and I'd like you to open the window, please. If you just say, I'm hot, then I'll, I'll, I'll know that you're hot, but I won't realise that you want me to do something about it. Um, and, and, you know, sure, we get better at these things over time, but like if I'm tired or overwhelmed or I've got other things going on in my head or what you're asking for just isn't that obvious, I will not understand, and this may well be true of your autistic friend as well. So if you want something, just ask for it. Well, never mind. And if we don't want to do the thing that you're asking for, we will just say no, because that's how many of us are. Um, so, yeah, ask for what you want. Be very, very clear in your instructions and try to keep things as simple as possible. So particularly if you're giving any kind of instructions, directions, that sort of thing, keep it simple and chunk it. Because, again, we can find it quite hard to follow communication, particularly verbal communication and minimize any sort of um, body language or facial expression sort of expected to convey meaning. Try to use actual words where you can as well. Uh, because again, we're not always the best at picking up on those things and particularly if we're already a bit fatigued. Uh, number four, four is to be patient and understanding. So kind of linked to that communication thing where I'm saying we don't always like understand really, really well. Um, sometimes we can seem a bit slow um, and our processing of information might not be great and we might not fully understand what's expected of us. We're not stupid. We just process things differently than other people. And we've got so much going on all at the same time. We're processing so many things, always many, many, many thoughts going on in our head at any one time. And this very, very overwhelming world that's so full of all these things that our heightened senses are picking up on um, can mean that, you know, it just takes us a moment sometimes. So being a bit patient, recognising we might need a little bit more time to do things and actually giving us space to do those things. Don't jump in and complete the sentence for us. Don't hurry us along if you can possibly avoid it. Just give us just a little bit more time and space. Uh, it can make the world of difference. Sometimes if you've got a good relationship with your friend, then they, they might not mind you jumping in and finishing the sentence, for example. So I have an issue sometimes that um, I, whenever I start talking about this, I lose my words. I have an issue sometimes that I lose my words. So if I become overwhelmed, then I will tend towards muteness or, or, or very small amounts of talking, which is probably quite unlikely uh, you may feel because uh, if you're listening to my podcast, you just hear me rambling on all the time. But between those times, there are periods when I literally cannot string a sentence together, which is always rather fun, especially when it happens on stage. It doesn't happen on stage very often, uh, but I have to work incredibly hard hard to find those words and get them out on some occasions. Um, but sometimes if I'm having a not really finding the words moment, then some friends who know me well might uh, look to try and understand what I might be trying to say or might acknowledge looks like you're finding it a bit tricky to talk right now. Do you want me to talk or something like that? But yeah, the general one, number four was be patient, 
and uh, yeah, be be a little bit understanding. Don't don't rush us and give us enough space to participate because it just might take us a little bit longer uh, than than other people. One of the most frustrating things, and one of the reasons why I personally find being in a group really hard, is that sometimes I find by the time that I've processed the thing that was being said like five minutes ago, and I now know what I want to say, everybody else has like moved on completely, and that can be quite challenging. It's one of the reasons why I really like like online chat because a I can read it. It, which I find much, much easier than hearing it. Um, and B, I then can respond in my own time. So like me and my friend David have these epic WhatsApp conversations and we can just respond at what point we're ready and in bullet points and with numbers. I have huge appreciation of his communication style with me. Um, number five is about respecting routines. We love rules. We love routines. We love rituals. Um, so when you live in a world that doesn't make sense, so the neurotypical world does not make sense to me as a neurodivergent person. Um, and so I try to introduce little rules, like about the order of my books in their colour order. These are all little ways in which to try and take control of a world that makes no sense to me day to day. I try to control the bits that I can. OK, um, and some of this is achieved through things like routines and rituals. And so I'm might have specific ways of doing things and they might seem a bit weird or quirky to you but if they offer me a little bit of reassurance a little bit of comfort a little bit of control in a world that feels chaotic then just wonder whether it's actually doing any harm and if it's not then maybe just roll with it and join in um yeah might be weird might be odd but whatever so, for example, every time that I arrive at my local climbing wall, which is where I've been today all day, and I don't know, you maybe if you're on the video, you can see how disgusting all my hands are. I've been root setting all day um, and my, my hands are covered in chalk and grime because I've been putting up roots. Anyhow, every time I arrive at the local climbing wall, um, regardless of how recently I went for a wee, when I arrive, then I go upstairs to a particular toilet, always has to be the same toilet, and I go to the toilet before I go for a climb. And there's absolutely no good reason for that at all. I live 20 minutes from the wall. I will have also gone to the loo before I left because my grandma always taught me to do that. But this is my routine. And it's one of those things I wasn't even necessarily aware that I had this. And then I put all my shoes on and uh, in, in a sort of particular order and fill up my bottle. And I have a whole like sequence of things that I do, which I've just been doing for quite a long time. And I didn't really know I did it until I started climbing regularly with my daughter, Ellie, who picked up on it, not in a judgmental way. She just noticed and one day just said, hey, I'll start climbing while you do your routine and I was like huh my routine oh yeah I suppose I do but it doesn't do anyone any harm and it offers me a bit of comfort and calm and um, particularly helpful around times of transition so going from nice calm quiet office to a busy climbing wall for example so respect those routines uh number six in how to be a good friend with your autistic friend think about things that you are both interested in and maybe try and develop some shared interests. So if there's one thing we're really good at, it's about getting really interested in stuff. So A, if you're already interested or could be a bit interested in something that we already spend a lot of time doing, so that might be an area of special interest or hyper focus for us. And you might be like, oh, hey, Pookie, could I come join in with the climbing? Or could I like learn about flying, for example? Like if you did that, then I'm right there on the same page with you. I want to do this thing with you. But equally, you may have an interest or there might be something we could explore together that we could both become interested in. And yeah, so we are often really good at the researching, jumping in, getting really involved, finding the flow, really getting like properly immersed in activity. So if there are areas that we can do that together in, that would be really awesome. And it's much easier for me, for many autistic people, to do alongside than just simply to be alongside other people. So I'd find it really, really hard just to go to the pub with you or go to a cafe with you and have a coffee unless I know you really well. No, even then I'd find it hard. So unless we had a specific thing we needed to talk about. So for example, my friends Rich and Marianne will come for coffee and we'll just sit and chat. But they're my flying friends. We have all the flying things to talk about. And so that's really like easy. If it was just general passing of conversation, like I, I don't even know how that, I just can't just know. But 
if, for example, you said, hey, let's go for a walk because I love to walk in the countryside, then I'm all over it. Or let's go for a fly or went for a bike ride with friends at the weekend. Doing a thing together is so much easier for me in order to maintain and enjoy that friendship with you than just being with you. So lots and lots of friends will be like, hey, we haven't seen you for ages. Let's go for lunch, Ah, which no, that's fraught with challenge for me, for many other people too. Or, you know, let's just catch up for coffee. These ideas literally fill me with dread, but let's go for a walk that I'm all about. So, so think about doing rather than being um, may help your autistic friend, certainly helps me and, and many other autistic people I've spoken to. And also think about whether there are specific shared interests that you could develop together. Uh, number seven is about offering your support in social situations. So thinking about when there may be situations that your friend might find challenging, what you can do in order to be a good ally or friend to them in those times. So, for example, you could talk to your friend ahead about like if they became overwhelmed and found it really difficult to make a decision about something or to contribute to the conversation or to navigate certain situations, what would they like you to do in order to be able to help them? And are there things you can do to advocate for them? Are there any particular things that other people might do that they might find sort of triggering or challenging in any way that they could look out for that you could just sort of let? people know not to do or point out why this might be challenging, for example. So an example for me of, of something that uh, a friend who I fly with does for me in social situations, who I'm, I'm so, so grateful to him. So this is a, a guy called Rob, who um, knows that I have prosopagnosia, so I cannot recognise faces. This is, this is a, a diagnosis I'm starting to try and own a bit because it makes me really anxious not knowing who I'm going to be talking to even when they're really known so like even my husband's face I don't recognize if I'm not expecting it um but anyway so but but this causes quite a degree of anxiety if I'm going to be in a social situation of people who I know will know me and I'm meant to know but I don't know who they are it's surprisingly like anxiety provoking so my friend Rob knows this and every time I see him so he's a flying friend every time I see him on the hill or in like a coaching meeting or something he'll come up to me and he'll say hi Pookie it's Rob. How are you doing? I'm here with Brian. He's over there wearing the blue coat. Um, and also you'll see that over there is Dave, Nick and Michael or, or whatever. And he'll point them out um, and help me to work out who's in the room. Um, and this offers remarkable relief uh, and, 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 and help and support because it, it just reduces the anxiety for me. I kind of have an idea who's in the room. Uh, he helps me to, to pick out who people are, know what they're wearing. So I've got some anchors and I might be able not to make a complete fool of myself later on. So that's just like one example. But there's lots and lots of different ways that you might be able to help your autistic friend. But just, just talk to them about it. Say, how can I be helpful? Like you, this might be a situation that you're a bit anxious about. What can I, as your friend, do to reduce that anxiety and make this feel more possible for you it might also be like uh, I leave situations quite suddenly sometimes I often go without saying goodbye because all the saying goodbye is um well just really stressful and if I'm leaving it's because I'm no longer coping generally speaking so I don't want to do all the saying goodbye so I'll just tend to disappear so you might leave a friend with instructions that um either to help you disappear if you need to um or um as the friend you might let people know um, just, you know, uh, yeah, sorry, um, my, my friend would have meant no offence at all. It's just that they're autistic um, and they sometimes get a bit overwhelmed in social situations. So they'll have gone off to uh, go and, and, and regulate. People are remarkably understanding about such things, but it can be helpful sometimes to have a friend who explains that if people don't already know. Number eight is to be inclusive. So think about how you can make sure that your friend is actually included in social situations if they want to be. Um, so what people sometimes assume is because we often don't turn up to stuff that we don't want to. And actually, that's not quite true. A, it's really nice always to be invited, even if you don't want to come. Um, but B, sometimes it's that we want to, but can't this time, but next time we might be able to, or there might be certain social situations that we're more prepared to like go out on a limb for and risk a bit of burnout for. Um, and it may also be that there are steps that our friends can take to make our social situations a little bit more inclusive. So meeting in smaller groups or in quieter places 
places or there's all sorts of things and again thinking with your friend about what would make this feel more accessible for you what can we as your friends do to help and then perhaps you as the friend taking a little bit of a lead on that so that you can inform other people or try to encourage a slightly more inclusive environment can make the world of difference otherwise you can end up uh, as the autistic person just doing fewer and fewer and fewer things and it's a really difficult one because the fewer things that you do um, the harder it is to do things and so your world gets kind of smaller and smaller and smaller so that's a little bit tough but on the other hand if you keep putting yourself out there and every time it's really hard and you get kind of you know sort of burnt out and dysregulated and things as a result of those things and it's kind of not very motivating so yeah I must say I've tended to do fewer and fewer things and say no a lot more um, but trying to find other friends and other activities that do feel more accessible for me for different reasons so trying to find a balance there but as the friend you can really help with this have some open honest discussions with your autistic friend think how can we make this inclusive are there changes that we can make um Number nine is about respecting personal space. So sometimes your autistic friend will just want some space from you and it won't be that they don't like you anymore um, and it won't be that you've necessarily done anything wrong or anything like that at all. Sometimes we just need a bit of space to reset, to regulate, to get our brains back in order. We just it, It's just something that many autistic people will crave, just a bit of solitude, a little bit of space from the world, not just from you. And so respecting that and not like pushing too hard um, for engagement, for involvement sometimes uh, can be really helpful and then also just on like a physical um kind of basis as well like day-to-day -day personal space as well is something it's worth exploring with your autistic friend so again all autistic people are different i am a hugger and if you are someone i know and love then there's nothing i will want more than a really really firm deep hug that's one of the most regulating things for me from the right people um i i love a hug but many autistic people absolutely do not and and they really, really Really wouldn't want that but it's worth I would not want a hug from the wrong person so you know this, this is a challenging one um, and maybe many people um, feel like that I don't think that's just an autistic thing that you wouldn't want a hug from someone you didn't know um, random hug hooray that's awkward um, but yeah I, I, I love a hug I absolutely love a hug um, and you know again this is one of those consent things just always sort of seeking consent <laughs> sometimes for that hug uh, can can help but but find out you know in terms of that personal space and how close you can be to your autistic friend and, and things like that just just check what feels comfortable because many of us are a little bit more needing of our space than other people so like if I go to um, I don't know, a restaurant or the cinema or something like I'm much happier if I'm on the end of the road. Like I don't like being boxed in. I want to know that I can escape. This really, really matters to me. Um, and, you know, all these little things. It's just about getting curious, beginning to understand your friend's world uh, a little bit. Finally, how you can be a good friend to an autistic person is just to kind of be an advocate for inclusivity. So just pick people up when they get stuff wrong. People can be unkind, judgmental, inappropriate, insensitive um, about us. And it would just be really nice now we've got allies out there picking people up and saying, you know, things like, no, you can't be just a little bit autistic explaining a little bit about autism educating people a bit or explaining that the reason that we seem rude is because of x or the reason that we need this reasonable adjustment is because of y just having people out there who get it who care and who recognize that we're pretty awesome actually um and making that quite clear i don't know just 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 I just love the idea that we'd have an army of allies out there. Like we try and advocate for ourselves, but it's tiring. Um, and you don't have to actually be autistic to be an autistic ally. And so you can do that as a friend. OK, so there you go. Ten ideas for how you can be a good friend to someone who is autistic. I hope there were some helpful ideas in here for you. If you liked what you heard today, please like, subscribe and share my work. As always, you can support my work further by joining me over on Patreon, where you'll get access early to all of my resources and the chance to influence what I work on next. Or you can go nuclear and invite me to speak at your next event or in your setting, either virtually or face to face. Thank you so much for listening and for everything that you are doing for the children and young people in your care. It matters. This has been Pookie Ponders with me, Pookie Knightsmith. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate and keep pondering. Over. Ah.